Um, If you have your Bibles, I'm going to get you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 11 and 12. And when you get it, you can stand. And if you don't have it and you don't have a Bible, stand whenever they put it on the screens. And it should be coming up any moment. Go ahead. Stand for the reading of the Word. We'll stand for famous people and uh, what am I looking for? Political people. I think it's okay to stand for the Word of God. Amen? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, it says, says this, And He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors, say pastors, and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Really quickly before we move on, I want to say that this is commonly referred to as the fivefold ministry. All you Bible school students, you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, But there are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And these are all offices and roles that God has appointed within the church around the world. And this is for a purpose. And the purpose is in verse 12. It's to perfect the saints. Somebody say, that's me. But sometimes we read this wrong because verse 12, it looks like a threefold job description for the fivefold ministry, and that's not the case at all. If you were to read verse 12 properly and understand it properly, it would say something like this. The fivefold ministry is for the perfecting of the saints so that they can engage in the work of the ministry so that the body of Christ can be edified. It is not just the role of the fivefold ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, to do ministry work. That is the job of the saints as well. Anybody believe that tonight? So anyway, nonetheless, that's a side note. We're talking about a pastor's purpose, purpose, and that is something that God gave to the church. And also Matthew 9, verse 36, really quickly, and I'll let you be seated. It says this, but when he, speaking of Jesus, saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and they were scattered abroad as sheep. Somebody say sheep. <clears throat> Having no shepherd. Somebody say shepherd. Tonight again, I'm just speaking very openly, very practically on this subject, the pastor's purpose. Could you just lay your Bibles down and pray with me over this message and over the next couple of weeks? I really believe God wants to speak to us. Let's all pray together. Lord Jesus, we worship you tonight. And God, we're so thankful for your word. We're about to go into it. We look at it. We look at this message from a different angle. And I just pray, God, that your word would go forth and accomplish something in our lives and in our hearts. God, do something beyond man's ability. God, get me out of the way. It's not about what I have to say or my opinions, but God, let your word go forth and do something powerful in this place. God, we give you glory and honor and praise and worship tonight. God, this is your word. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. You can sit down. In Jesus' name. Let me start off by saying this, and I'm not going to be an extremely long time tonight. I'll try to move quickly. But let me start by saying everybody needs a pastor. Everybody needs a pastor. It is not God's will that we come into this thing called the church, that we experience the new birth, we repent, we're baptized in His name, and we're filled with the Holy Ghost. Um, It's not God's will that that we have that experience, and then we become islands unto ourselves, not accountable to anybody. It is God's will that everybody has a pastor. It's not optional, but rather it is imperative. Everybody needs a pastor. I think deep down, all of us know that and we understand that. But sometimes, I think where the discrepancy comes is that sometimes we don't know what a pastor is and we don't understand the purpose of a pastor. And if we fully understood the purpose of a pastor, I think that we would um, be able to live this out a little bit better. So, We're going to talk about the purpose of a pastor tonight. And to start, I want to tell you not what a pastor is, but rather what a pastor is not. Because we get all kinds of weird ideas sometimes in Christianity nowadays. First of all, a pastor is not someone who does all the work of ministry. A pastor is not somebody who does all the work of ministry. Sometimes people think that The pastor and the staff do all of these jobs. They visit the sick. They preach the sermons. They make sure the the building and and the church is all uh, kept up and whatnot. Um, And the saint's job is to just put money in the offering and pay their salary. And nothing could be further from the truth. 2 Corinthians 3 and 6, it says that we are all called to be ministers. We are all able-bodied ministers 
in the New Testament church. In Acts chapter 6, there were 12 apostles. They were kind of like pastors in the early church. And in Acts chapter 6, they appointed men that were full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom to tend to and care for the widows. That was a ministry, but it's not something that the pastors or the leaders of the church could do all on their own. You see, ministry was not just the responsibility of one man or a group of men. Ministry was a responsibility of many. It was a responsibility of the church. So first of all, a pastor is not, somebody say not, somebody who does all of the work of ministry. Somebody say a big amen to that. Can I just say that we need you to get involved in the work of the church locally and globally. We need you to get involved in ministry and put your shoulder to the wheel and really push God's kingdom forward. Amen? We need you. I need you. We, we can't do this as leaders and as a staff and all that stuff. We can't do this by ourselves. We need the saints of God to realize that they have such power uh, resident within them and they can impact the kingdom of God for the good and cause it to expand. So we need you tonight and in the future, not just tonight. That would be very short. Live. So a pastor is not somebody that does all the ministry work. Secondly, and I'm only going to list these two things and move on, a pastor is not someone uh, who just preaches sermons. I think sometimes people get this in their head. I, I, I think they don't really believe it, but they kind of live like they believe it. Um, yes, pastors preach. We are called to feed the flock. The Bible says that it pleased God that by the foolishness of preaching uh, to save them that believe. So there is a place for preaching in the life of Christians, and it's, there's a place for preaching in the role of a pastor, but that is not our only role, and that is not my only role in your life. Ultimately, our role as pastors is to keep watch for your souls, first and foremost, and secondly, to engage you in ministry. That is my job. That is my role. It's not to get up and preach fancy sermons. I, I hope that you enjoy coming to the revolution and you like listening to the messages that are preached. But that is not my first and foremost priority in leading you guys as your youth pastor. First and foremost, my responsibility is to uh, watch for your souls and to engage you in ministry. And if that's not happening in your life, then there is a disconnect in the pastor-saint relationship because that's what needs to be happening. Um, my role in your life, again, is not to just preach to you every Wednesday. Now listen to this. Some of you, I'm sure, maybe some of you don't. I'm not trying to be, uh, uh, I'm not trying to assume here tonight, but I think a lot of you would probably love me or like me as your preacher. But some of you have fired me as your pastor. Because there's a big difference between a preacher and a pastor. Sometimes people think that, you know, oh, I came to church, I listened to a sermon, you know, that was my youth pastor pastoring me. And yeah, I can try to pastor you through a sermon, but, you know, some of you, you, you love me as your preacher, but you fired me as your pastor. Because for some of you, I could approach you about something in your life that I, I just sense is not right. A direction you're going that's not the will of God for you. Um, maybe, you know, you're living in some sort of sin. And I could approach, approach you about it, and you'd ignore me because you don't see me as your pastor. Maybe a preacher, but not a pastor. It's not because necessarily you're a bad person, but perhaps it's just because you don't understand a pastor's purpose. You see, everybody needs a man or a woman of God that is willing to look them eyeball to eyeball. And like Nathan the prophet to David the king say, you are the man, you are the woman that is wrong. You're not living right. You need to make things right with God. Everybody needs a pastor that has the courage to look us face to face and say those kinds of things. You don't just need somebody that's going to you know, say everything that you want to hear. You need somebody that will confront you from time to time. That's okay. It's okay to be confronted because everybody needs a pastor. Everybody needs a pastor. So if those are the things that a pastor is not, uh, let's take a minute and look at the things that a pastor is, okay? And just by the way, I, I'm not shooting at anybody or pointing at anybody. Uh, I'm just trying to tell you the truth from the Bible, okay? So you can all just, why don't we just all like take a deep breath in, go ahead and just let it out, and then smile while you're doing that. Somebody say, praise the Lord. So what is a pastor? What is a pastor? In Scripture, a pastor is compared to a shepherd. Anybody see my lovely staff here tonight? 
it's pretty. Um, I think this is the one that, um, I don't know, John the Baptist used or something. I got it off eBay. I'm just kidding. I didn't. <clears throat> it was off Amazon. I'm just kidding. Should I go another one? No, I'm just kidding. In Scripture, a pastor is compared to a shepherd. Now, if we can understand the responsibilities of a shepherd to sheep, then we can better understand the responsibilities of a pastor to the saints because in the Bible, a pastor is always likened to a shepherd. Uh, the Hebrew word, ra'ah, which is translated pastors in the book of Jeremiah, is also translated as shepherd, herdsman, keeper, and feeder elsewhere in the Old Testament. So we say ra'ah. Hebrew for pastor. The Greek word poimen, which is translated pastors in Ephesians, is also translated shepherd elsewhere in the New Testament. And these two words, they show us that a pastor is a shepherd, one who tends or herds flocks. He feeds them. Excuse me. He guides and he supervises them. And can I tell you, that is my role in this youth group. It's not to just get up and preach sermons, but rather to tend to and to serve you. Ministry is all about serving. And if you're aspiring to be in the ministry, you need to realize that um, it's all about serving. I, I do this first and foremost to serve you in your walk with God, to help you to grow in your walk with God. My purpose and my role here in this youth group is to herd sheep together, to help grow this flock called the Revolution as a part of this local church. I have a responsibility to feed you and also to guide, correct, and supervise you. Not like a babysitter, but as a pastor, as a shepherd. And we like most of those things, just sometimes not the last few. We love to, to think of our pastor as somebody who serves us and tends to us, somebody that grows our church or youth group. We love to think of our pastor as somebody who feeds us a fresh word every week from the Bible. But sometimes we don't like to think of a pastor as somebody who guides, corrects, and supervises, so to speak, us. Can I just tell you again that you don't need somebody who's always just going to appease and appeal to your itching ears, telling you what you want to hear. You need somebody who will confront you, who will correct you if you're going off and going astray. When you're not doing well spiritually, sometimes you get so blind to your own ways. And sometimes the voice of a pastor is all that can pull you back on track. You need a pastor. This is not something that you hear at school. This is not something that you hear in the workplace. Our culture teaches us to question and push back against all forms of authority and not respect them. In the book of Genesis, we read how the Egyptians, they hated shepherds. Genesis 46, 34, the last part of that verse, it says, for every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Now in your Bible, most of you would know this, but it's always, Egypt is always a symbol of the world. And just as shepherds, were an abomination to the Egyptians in the Old Testament. So the ministry of a pastor is to a godless world. Our world resists the concept of having authority over you, but God desires every single person to have a pastor, somebody who will guide you, correct you if necessary, and have charge for your souls. A shepherd. Let me say a shepherd. Everybody needs a pastor. Everybody needs a pastor. Now, all God-appointed and God-anointed pastors, they are, not, they are also not to be islands unto themselves. And that, that's also an issue. I, I can't remember the name right off the top of my head, but um, you know, there have been a lot of wacky pastors from different denominations over the years, in different church groups and whatever. Um, you ever heard the story, somebody might help me with the name, but that guy, he was like some kind of a, a leader of some church, and he led everybody out into the wilderness to drink poison Kool-Aid. What's that guy's name? What is it? Jim Jones, that's right. Look it up. It, it's a really crazy story. Like, he literally, he's like, you know, drink this Kool-Aid. It's going to be cool. And they, it was poison. They all died. <clears throat> I'm telling you, I'm not lying to you. Just look it up. And that's because this guy obviously was not in line with the will of God. He was messed up. I'm telling you something. Um, and it's important that pastors, too, they're not islands unto themselves. Pastors need to have pastors. That's important. Uh, some people disagree with this. Some people say, well, who was in, in the Bible? Who was Paul's pastor? And who was Peter's pastor? And 
and all that kind of stuff. Well, if you read Scripture, James was their pastor. He was the pastor of the Jerusalem church after Peter moved on. So even pastors need to have pastors. And ultimately, all pastors need to be subject unto God. Um, So Jesus Christ, He is the ultimate example for pastors. In John 10 and 11, Jesus is the good shepherd. He's the great shepherd in Hebrews 13, 20. He's the chief shepherd in 1 Peter 5 and 4. In 1 Peter 2, 25, Jesus is the shepherd and bishop of our souls. And He's Jehovah Ra'ah, the Lord is my shepherd in Psalm 23 and 1. Jesus Christ is the pattern for all shepherds, for all pastors. He is, if you will, the supreme pastor and shepherd, and all pastors are to follow His example. If you were to read through John chapter 10, um, I hope this is okay tonight. A little bit, a little bit scripture intensive, kind of teaching you guys something. That's not a bad thing. Uh, but in John 10, you can read through it on your own time, the first 16 verses of that chapter. Jesus shows us how a good shepherd should operate. In verse number four, we learn that a good shepherd has the sheep that follow him. Why? Because they know his voice. That's for Jesus, yes, but also for pastors. You need to be familiar as sheep, I guess, or as saints to the voice of your pastor. You need to discern uh, between different voices. You shouldn't listen to all the voices out in the world and and stuff you hear on YouTube and and all the stuff that you hear from different churches around town and different so-called Christians. You need to learn the voice of your shepherd. Somebody say amen to that. There's a lot of stuff on YouTube that's absolute crap. That's the truth. I listen to some of it, but I know how to take the meat and leave the bones. And you need to be able to discern that too. You need to know the voice of your shepherd. A good shepherd in verse 5, this is kind of the opposite of that. He has sheep that don't follow strangers because they don't know their voice. If you hear something in another arena, whether that be online or wherever, and it doesn't sit well with you, that's that inward sense that this is a voice that should not be speaking to me, and you need to ignore that voice. Somebody say amen. In verse number 11, a good shepherd, he's going to give his life for his sheep. That's the mark of a good pastor and a good shepherd. In verse number 12, a good shepherd stays with the sheep even when the wolves come, even when the waters start rising and the floods start coming and things aren't always going so well, a good shepherd stays put. And he stays with the flock. Verse 14 tells us that a good shepherd, he knows his sheep, and they know him on a personal level. A shepherd's not somebody that should be just so disconnected from their flock, so disconnected from the people that they lead, that really sets them up for failure. A good shepherd knows his sheep, and they know him. In verse 16, we learn that a good shepherd brings other sheep into the fold. It's not an exclusive club for you know, us four no more. A good shepherd is all-inclusive, and he wants everybody to get into this thing called the church, the family of God. Now, that's the responsibility of the shepherd, the responsibility of pastors. And we often like to talk about the responsibilities of pastors because, hey, we, we pay our tithes, and we, we pay their salaries. But, you know, sheep also have certain responsibilities. As a saint of God, it's not enough for you to just look at the pastor and say he should do this and this and this, and then ignore all your responsibilities. Because as a saint of God, you do have some to adhere to. First of all, sheep. Let me say sheep. Can somebody just let out like a nice bleat for me? Just go ahead. I was trying, I was actually gonna call my friend and get a live sheep in here, but I was scared of the poop. So I left that alone. <laughs> if we had a sheep, somebody was gonna have, have bucket following duty. Yeah, you guys are all sheep. I'm a sheep too because I'm submitted and and I have a pasture. But you guys are sheep. And sheep must recognize their need of the shepherd who is anointed by God. You know you have need of a pastor. It's not just optional. You have need of one in your life. It's important. Sheep must recognize their need of a sheepfold, a pasture, which is the local church. Some people think they can serve God all by themselves islands unto themselves, and that's not true. You need a shepherd, you need a sheepfold, you need a pastor, and you need the local church. Sheep must learn to obey the shepherd's voice and to flee from strange voices. We kind of talked about that already. Sheep must be willing to follow the shepherd as he follows Jesus, the chief shepherd, 
sometimes when change comes and the pastor tries to implement things and, and he tries to shift our focus to something that is more you know, of God's will for the season, sometimes we want to resist that and we don't want to follow. But it's important as saints of God, as sheep, that you follow the shepherd as he follows God's will. And sheep, finally, they must also recognize that their purpose is to reproduce. Sheep beget sheep. That's in the Bible. Shepherds, in their role as a sheep, submitted to another man of God, yeah, they're, they're to be involved in the harvest, absolutely. But it is not just the role of the shepherd to beget sheep or to have children that are sheep. Offspring, whatever. You know what I'm trying to say. Sheep have sheep. Shepherds don't have sheep. Sheep have sheep. And yeah, it's the job of the shepherd to be welcoming and all-inclusive and bring them in and work with people, absolutely. But it's the job and the responsibility, first and foremost, of the sheep to reproduce and have sheep. Spiritually speaking. Come on, let's be mature about this. Anybody understand what I'm trying to say? You got it. Let's move on. It's important that you, as you mature in Christ that you take on these responsibilities. A lot of times, again, we like to look at the pastor. Oh, he should do this. They should do this. I'm, I'm good. I, I pay my tithes. But it's important that you adhere to those responsibilities as a saint of God. You need to realize tonight, as a sheep, that without a shepherd, you're going to wander astray from time to time. And most likely, you won't be able to find your way home. The shepherd has the innate ability to look above the, the grass that you're grazing in and see off into the distance the direction that you're going. When you can't, you're distracted by the tall grass. You're distracted by the, you know, the field. You're, you're kind of submerged in the grass, if you will. You need to rely on a pastor, on a shepherd in those moments when you're wandering astray. You need to realize that without a shepherd, sheep are helpless and defenseless against their enemies. You need to realize that uh, sheep need the shepherd to lead them as they can't lead themselves fully and effectively. You can't risk being independent as a sheep because it's dangerous on your own. You must stay in the flock where it's safe. You need the flock. And you need the shepherd. You need them. And without them, you aren't going to make it. The shepherd is there for your good. He, he's not there to make your life miserable. He's not there to make you mad and get you all up in arms and, and, and tensed up. No, he, he's there for your good. And you need to follow him and be submitted to the leadership of your shepherd, of your pastor. Romans chapter 13, starting at verse 1, it says this, Let every soul... Be subject unto the higher powers. It says there's no power but of God. But then it says this, the powers that be, they're ordained of God. And whosoever therefore resisteth the powers that be, they resist the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. What these verses are trying to say and how it's applicable to us tonight is that God has called men and women to shepherd His flock. He's called pastors. And when we resist them, we literally resist God. When your pastor stands up in front of you and says, let's worship the Lord, let's, let's all stand, let's all do this, um, that's a very basic and simple example. But when you uh, resist that, you're not just resisting a man or a woman, you're resisting God. And that's Scripture. Um, when we rebel against them and against what they tell us and instruct us to do, we rebel against God. When we're not submitted to them, you might think that you still have something going with God. But quite frankly, you're not submitted to God if you're not submitted to the man of God. Somebody once wisely said they were 100% right. You can't be right with the master if you're not right with your pastor. And if your pastor says, no, I want you home for this service, and you ignore that, and I'm just speaking about myself. I'm just talking plainly here. I have no motive or no, no vendetta or whatever here tonight. And you resist that, you're resisting God. If you don't submit to your pastor, you're not submitted to God. If your pastor says, you know, I don't know about this, this relationship. I don't know about this uh, job or this career path that you're on. I don't know about this or that in your life. And you just kind of go on with it anyway. 
Not being submitted to the man of God is the exact same as not being submitted to God. And we've done a great disservice in modern day Christianity to think that we can have something going with God all by ourselves. No, we can't. God has set it up that way in His kingdom that He anoints and appoints men and women of God within the local church and within His global church to pastor His flock. And you can't be right with the Master if you're not right with your pastor. We can't afford to take what our pastor says just as optional material. We need to be in submission to the voice of our shepherd. That's not to say that you can't voice concerns or your opinions, but at the end of the day, you need to understand something very powerful. Okay, Just give me your attention for a few more minutes here. You need to understand that God has gifted your pastors. He didn't just call them to do a job and not given them the ability to do it. And He has gifted your pastors to see things that you can't always see. And you may think that your decision is wonderful, it's great, it's the best thing going for your life. Maybe every friend that you have thinks that it's wonderful. But if your pastor says, I don't know, it's not sitting well with me in my spirit, you need to heed the voice of your pastor because God has gifted them to see things you can't see. He's given them wisdom sometimes beyond their intelligence even. And you need to take advantage of that and heed the voice of the shepherd in your life. They speak into your life on behalf of God. And that's not something that you can afford to take lightly. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, it says, Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. You might think that your submission to your pastor is just submission to some man. Some guy that, you know, he's the leader of your church. But can I tell you, ultimately, your submission to that man of God is submission to God Himself. And that's why in Hebrews 13, 17, it says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Look at this. For they watch for your souls. They watch for your souls. If a pastor is really doing things right and out of the right motive, then what they say to you, the correction that they offer you, is because they see that this ultimately will affect your eternal destination. You know, if they have some wrong motive, God will deal with them. You still need to stay submitted. But you've got to obey them that have the rule over you. Submit yourselves to them, for they watch over your soul as they must give account that they may do it with joy, not with grief. For that's unprofitable for you. Can I just tell you tonight, and I'm just going to wrap up here probably in another five to ten minutes. Just stick with me. Submission to a pastor is powerful. There is an anointing that rests on people who are submitted. You know what submission means? Submission means putting your mission under the mission of somebody or something else. Submission. And when you bring your life and you kind of let all your goals sit on the back burner and you say, God, I want to follow your will. I want to push your kingdom forward first and foremost. There's power in that. And God will take care of all your plans and God will take care of all your life goals and all the things that you're wanting to do. We, we all know that the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you, right? And sometimes when we let our ambition sit on the back burner, and we put our mission on the back burner, we submit to the mission of our local church, and we submit to the mission and the mandate of God's Word, there's power there. You guys are being awful quiet tonight, but I hope that doesn't mean you disagree with what I'm saying. Submission is a powerful thing. If you agree with something tonight, I hope you feel free to say amen. There's power in that too. Submission is powerful. God's anointing, it always flows downward. In the Old Testament, when kings and priests were anointed for God's use, they would have anointing oil, literally oil, poured over their heads, and that would uh, establish their role in the kingdom of God. And that oil, it would flow down. And in Psalms, it speaks of the oil flowing down Aaron's beard and onto his garment and down onto the ground. And can I tell you that the anointing, it flows downward even today. And if you want God to anoint your life and use you, then you need to come underneath the leadership of your pastor, under the leadership of the man of God. It's simply the over-under principle. God can't put you over something 
and anoint you to do something great in His kingdom until you first come under the leadership of the man of God. There is no power. There is no anointing off by yourself, doing your own thing, trying to live for God without being submitted to the man of God. There is anointing that flows down. that You can't get any other way except through submission to your pastor. And you know, submission... I'm going to actually ask the music to come back. I'm almost done. Submission, it can't be proven in times when you agree. Some of us have heard this before. But submission can't be proven when you agree with your pastor or with your leaders. Only when you disagree can you prove that you're submitted to authority. Agreement is powerful. When two or three agree in anything, the Bible says it will be done unto them. Something along those lines. So agreement is powerful. But submission is even more powerful. And you can only truly submit when you disagree with what your leaders speak into your life. I said it already, but even if a pastor seems to be wrong, even if, you know, you've had other people say, yes, 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 but your pastor says, I don't feel it. Even if he's wrong in the end, your submission to him will still bless you. God will work it all out for you. God will work work things out with your pastor. He'll deal with that wrong judgment, and your pastor will learn from that too. But there is something that's powerful in submission, even when he potentially could be wrong, even when you disagree. We need to be submitted. We need to know the voice of our shepherd, and we need to heed it. And in conclusion tonight, I just want to leave you with one final kind of thought just to culminate everything that we've discussed tonight. There are times in life when we as sheep get off course and confused. I've seen it happen to many a young person, many a churchgoer. I've seen them just get confused. It's almost as if they're given over to a strong delusion. And usually it started because they weren't submitted to the man of God. It's in those times when we get off course and we get confused. It's in moments like these that we need a pastor. Isaiah 53, 6. It says, all we like sheep, so we say sheep, have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. You know, from time to time, sheep tend to wander. I've never been a shepherd. I've never been over in the Middle East where they herd sheep and all that stuff. But I know that sheep tend to wander. Sheep are dumb. They really are. I'm not saying that you're dumb or we're dumb, but we can be a little ignorant from time to time. Amen. Maybe, you know, if you know it all, go ahead. You know, you can go ahead and know it all, but I don't. Sometimes we can be a little ignorant. We wander off, get away from the herd. And this is when the shepherd goes and he attempts to rescue us. Matthew 18, 12, the last part of that verse, it says, if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, what does a good shepherd do? He leaves the 90 and 9. He goes into the mountains and he seeks that which has gone astray. You know, I'm very thankful tonight that in times in my life when I went wayward, I'm really thankful that I had a pastor that didn't write me off, didn't leave me to my own devices, and leave me lost in the wilderness somewhere. But they confronted me where I was at, and they challenged me to come back what I knew to be right. And sometimes we get mad or we get upset when we get confronted by our leaders. You need to realize that they can see things you can't see and they can discern things that sometimes you can't discern and they're ultimately trying to save your soul. And when you get mad in those moments, you're not doing them a disservice, you're doing yourself a great disservice. And you're only going to hurt yourself in the long run. If a man have a hundred sheep and one of them go astray, doesn't he leave the ninety-nine and go into the mountains and seek that which is gone? A good shepherd does what he can to try and rescue the sheep because the shepherd knows that there are wolves out there that will devour. He knows that there are thieves out there that will snatch up the sheep and take them away. The shepherd knows and he can see that there is a cliff just beyond the pasture. So he does what he can to correct the course of the sheep and bring them back the sheepfold because that's his job and that's his heartbeat 
Sometimes a shepherd will come up alongside you and with his rod of correction, he'll kind of nudge you back on course. With his staff, he will try to bring you back. And it doesn't always feel that comfortable when you're being jabbed in the side by the staff of your shepherd, so to speak. Sometimes it's the only thing that will get you back to the herd, get you back to the flock. And rather than getting upset at your pastors when they do that, thank your pastors when they do that. Rather than getting upset and saying, God, they, you know, what is wrong with them? Say, thank you, Jesus, that you've put somebody in my life with a backbone that will confront me where I am. There are times that we as saints, we begin to wander. Sometimes we don't even see what we're doing to be wrong. But it's in these times of wandering that I hope you thank God for pastors who come alongside and try to course correct your life and bring us back to the flock. He sees the danger that you're not able to see. You need to understand that when a pastor offers you a word of correction, he doesn't hate you. He doesn't dislike you. He doesn't want to make your life miserable. But it's because he sees where the path will lead when you can. God has gifted him to see those things that you're not able to see. It's not always easy to receive correction. And next week, we're going to be talking, as far as I know, on having a teachable spirit, which is kind of what this is about. It's not always easy to receive correction, especially when you're away from the flock. But it's in those moments that it's so imperative that you do so. Proverbs 15 and 10 says, Correction. Let me say correction. It's grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. You know, the ones that receive correction the best are the ones that are on fire for God, living for God, in the church, faithful. They're the ones that receive it best because they're still walking the straight and narrow way. But this verse tells us that those that forsake the way, correction is grievous. It's grievous unto them. can't stand it. It gets under their skin. It gives them the willies. But if you hate the reproof, the rest of that verse, it says you're going to die spiritually. When we're walking our own way, we've gotten off course. That correction is hard to receive. But if you don't receive it, it's all over. Barring a miracle from God, it's all over for you. That's all I have to say tonight. But I just want to tell you that you know, I haven't had to deal with this very much, and I'm thankful that I haven't. But I just want to tell you that if I ever approach you, if your lead pastors ever approach you and they confront you where you are, sometimes even if they just offer a recommendation that doesn't sit well with you, you need to receive that. If I ever approach you and it seems like I'm upset, I'm going to try to always speak the truth in love, but I'm human. You need to realize that it's not because I don't like you. It's because I I want us all to go to heaven together. I don't want anyone to miss out on the rapture. I don't want anyone to destroy their lives. I don't want anyone to hurt themselves to the point where it's it's irreparable damage. I, I don't want to see that because I have the heart of a shepherd. I love the flock that God has entrusted me to work with and to lead. And it pains me to see a young person get devoured by a wolf, fall off a cliff. I don't like that. It doesn't bring me joy when somebody wanders off. So if anything tonight, I would just ask you to think twice before rebuking the reproof. And if I'm not your youth pastor, if you're from another church, you need to make sure that you're submitted to your pastor. If you're in Bible school tonight and you're just kind of doing your own thing this year, kind of an island under yourself, you need to make sure that you get in touch with your pastor on a regular basis. Pray for him. See what he's feeling for your life because the role of a pastor is so important. Just because maybe you're in college this year and you're doing your own thing, university, whatever, don't be an island under yourself. Talk to your pastor. Get in touch with your pastor. See what he's feeling for you. Now that was in my notes. I'm not trying to ramble tonight. I'm just going to conclude. Why don't we all stand? Let's just pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you tonight, God.